would like to start? I guess I'll start. Um, what was your first or most impactful experience with racism that has shaped you into the person I am today? What I've experienced has been mostly microaggressions, just little subtle quips in order to in order to either feel less than or for someone to feel more dominant or to isolate me from a particular social circle that I believe I, I would benefit from, whether it be professional or social or even intellectual, you know? So for me, that's what I have particularly uh, experienced throughout my life, even so, as an adult. So my first experience with racism was transferring into a job with seniority and having the ability to bid on a better shift. Some of the whites were upset and it was two years, I worked there two years of unspoken racial overtones. So can you imagine being 19 going into a Southwest and Bell building, not knowing because you hadn't experienced that even in a systematic racism city as St. Louis, I didn't experience that, but going there and having to be humiliated by basically older white women. Mm -hmm. They weren't, it wasn't a lot of young women my age. It was older white women. And you can imagine how resentful they were that I came in with seniority and was able to bid on a better shift than them. So that was my very, very first experience with racism. My most impactful experience was uh, the fact that uh, my oldest brother, who uh, was a senior at the University of Houston, uh, he would take me over there when I was young uh, because he was doing some work on campus. Uh, and we were pulled over uh, by a couple of uh, Houston police officers late one night coming back from, from the campus. They snatched us out of the car, put guns to our heads, called us all sorts of uh, racial slurs. And so uh, they asked us, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What are you doing in this neighborhood? And my oldest brother tried to explain that, well, we live here. We live less than a mile from the University of Houston. This officer, these officers basically uh, just felt like we were in the wrong neighborhood. They never believed that we were uh, part of the neighborhood and lived in the neighborhood. And so uh, they let us go after after uh, one of them took out a knife and cut the back seat of my brother's car, got the badges of those officers and came home, told my father. He went down and of course, uh, they said, we don't have any officers that, uh, that have those those badge numbers. We don't know those names. So that was very impactful on me. There's a lot of stories about um, uh, individuals being uh, uh, harassed and and uh, and violated and thrown into the bios here in town. It's you know it was it was real to me, you know, growing up. But then you know I had to experience the things that happened when I started to to, to integrate schools. And so that's that's another whole story though. Then too, I was, we were the first black on the neighborhood and all of my neighbors were, were white. Um, and uh, I happened to be the first black uh, student at, at, in second grade that attended the school called Monta Vista Elementary School. I was the only black in the school. So when I went, so I went to school, the first, uh, the first day of school, the kids lined it up on the side of uh, the entryway into the elementary school. I was in the second grade. And they were singing a song to me, you know, and the song was, you know, nigger, nigger, nigger. And, um, and they sung that all the way in and all the way out. Well, I didn't know what a nigger was, uh, to be honest with you, and that's the honest truth. So one day I was um, singing that song, you know, at home. I was seven years old. I'm singing the song and dancing and dancing and carrying on like that. And it was like, okay. Uh, my dad says, what are you saying? 
And I'm saying, oh, this is a song the kids sing to me every day when I go to school. And that certainly did not go over well with them. I mean, the, the good news, I didn't know I was being insulted and calling a racial name because it just wasn't spoken in my family. I mean, my dad was in the military, so it just wasn't spoken in the family. And all the all the information, all the uh, reaction to me being subjected to that really um, was an, it was impactful. I'm not quite sure it was impactful to me because you have to be. I was too too young to know I was being, uh, right. you know, racially profiled. What does it mean to be black in America? Being in black in America for me is always my presence being questioned right. from a social standpoint right. where there's a there's a way that you are made to feel that you don't belong because of your skin or because or in and regardless of your experience or your let's say your professional achievements i feel i always have to be twice as good to be given the same opportunities and recognition for being successful as white in the corporate arena, as well as in the athletic arena. As a master's athlete who participates in the throwing events, I realized I had to be exceptional just to be accepted and recognized as an outstanding athlete in the throwing sport. And I did just that. You know, I always look back on what my mother instilled on me to be the best of me. You know, what does it mean to be black? You know, I, like I said earlier, I was always taught, and it was just drilled into me that I had to be this, I had to be smarter, and I worked, I had to work harder than any of my peers, and uh, that being average just was not going to cut it. And my, and my father, even as a female, my father just, you know paid attention to our grades and what we were getting and we knew we had to we had to bring home straight A's. Uh, that was just no option. What does it mean to be black in America to me? I want to I wanted to say, you know, the typical oh uh, we're magical, black girl, magic black boy joy. We're, you know, we're everything. But in reality it's mainly like everyone else has been saying we have to do way more than our counterparts to at least get accepted. For me, um, you know, as was previously stated by others, you know, I, things have, have moved along. Uh, I feel now that, you know, I have the freedom to express myself. I don't have to bite my words on or off the job. Uh, I've learned how to, uh, to recognize overt racism. You know, I don't give it any excuses. I uh, call it out when I see it. I try to educate. Um, I still feel like, as others have said, that I've had to, to work uh, triply to be uh, measured, you know, on the same uh, level or somewhat near level of my counterparts. You know, my career is, has uh, been vast. I haven't had a lot of jobs, but I've worked for major corporations. And in each one of those corporations, I've had something to to deal with, you know, I can remember when I lived in California because we all here in the South thought that at one time moving west in California it was, uh, you know, things were, were better. You know, I, I walked into my office one morning and there was a, a noose hanging uh, over my desk, and so that sort of thing uh, was uh, a shock to me. But you know, I dealt with it, and fortunately, the company uh, backed me, called a meeting of all 2,000 employees of that division, and they just decided they were not going to tolerate it, you know. And what are you doing, and what do you hope other people can do to enact or encourage change in our society? I understand the struggle has not accomplished equality in most areas. Education, housing, job opportunities, and just daily peace. My nonprofit foundation, Throwing and Growing, provides enrichment, enrichment musical and physical training programs in a black public high school in St. Louis, where the majority of the students feel there is no hope. I encourage them and I try to 
teach them that they have to be their own hope. And unfortunately, go above and beyond. You know, a A, a C is average. And anybody can be average. You know, I teach them to try to be responsible citizens. And that one of the most important things, they must vote. And also that to have a voice or to be recognized you have to be successful or achieve a higher standard. Nobody listens to a failure unless the failing person is making strides to be a better person. Right. So for me, uh, I think there's opportunity still to educate uh, others uh, about you know who we are as uh, as uh, minorities, you know, in the country. And thing for me is to try to educate. I think we could we could be more inclusive on the things that we do. You know, we we want to 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 be uh, uh, out there and, and tell our stories and be passionate about you know what it is that has affected us or what has held us back. But at the same time, some of the things I've done is try to understand the other side and try to understand their perception of us. But personally. I feel like at my age that I shouldn't have to do all the teaching. I shouldn't have to be telling people around my age that, hey, it's wrong to bring harm to somebody just because of the color of their skin. However, if I'm approached about a question or anything, I do still strive to um, educate and things of that nature. And I've also participated in our protests in my um, community. So yeah, those are the things that I have been doing. What I've been doing for the most part for the past, uh, for the past few weeks is I've done my best to try and, and, and educate those that inquire of me about various forms of racism and how they're intertwined within this country, how this country governs and how this country functions. You know, I have many people on social media um, reach out to me and they, you know, uh, go into my DMs and my PMs on Facebook and Instagram. And they ask like, whoa, JP, I didn't, I didn't know about this. Like they are so inert in the system that has been created for them that they just have no idea that it exists. They're just, they're just been completely indoctrinated into it. So I take it upon myself to educate them on the various forms of racism and what they can do in order to, you know, be a anti-racist or speak out against it, you know, and become an ally, so to speak, so that we can, you know, I guess, uh, uh, engage the system, not necessarily the symptoms. Like we've all seen, we've all experienced talking to racists and stuff like that. And unfortunately, a lot of them, it's not worth talking to. They're just a symptom of, a bigger problem. So what I've told people is it's, it's kind of moot to be in conversation with people that are so, you know, they're just so locked in and lack of a better word, hard headed as to, you know, their train of thought. However, if we go for the root of the problem, the symptom that is that, that they are a, I guess, a product by that would be a more, I guess, profitable and positive route. You know, also I tell people to, Hey, you know, you may not be able to peacefully protest. You may not be able to go out on the street and do stuff. You can donate. You can advocate. You can spread awareness. You can, you know, educate as far as the different literature that's out there. You know, go to multicultural or different cultures that are different from you and have an open mind and learn about where they come from and why they are the way that they are and think the way that they think. And, you know, that's just some of the, that's just some of the things that I, um, you know, I've, I've been doing for people. Are you shocked that when you tell those stories, um, your dad telling you not to get in the police car, you know, if you didn't do anything wrong, and here we are in 2020 and people are still dying in the back of police cars or, or dying being arrested, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's been 30, 40 years, 50 years, and, and that same thing is still going on where you don't want to get in the back of a police car or be arrested by a police officer because you might lose your life over something 
that you didn't do or something so simple? Well, yeah, you know, and that, that fear still is, is in my backpack. You know, as right. John was saying, you know, I still have those uh, subconscious uh, fears of, of a police officer pulling up behind me and, and, uh, and those things still exist, you know. Uh, so there are things that are subtle. There are things that uh, I would call secret behind closed doors uh, that still exist. And then there's things that are that are overt, you know. So some things you you may see, you may not be able to deal with. The the scarier things are the ones that are, that are still in secret, you know. How do we how do we get past that, you know? Uh, it's still it's still going to take a lot of work. It is a totally different generation for me because I grew up under. You go out there, you do the best, you be the best. Um, and this generation now, they just don't feel like they're going to get anywhere. And we have to continue to, because they're the foundation. As I always said, they're my future. They're going to be the ones that vote and make the difference on what happens in my life. And mm -hmm. if we don't educate them or give them some kind of guidance, then they will, not, they will continue to not see the value of their life or even the value of trying to um, make a difference. My children themselves, who are adults right now, they're totally aware of their heritage, you know, because I, I made a point for them to know where they're, they're coming from. And we were out at the winery, not as the traditional Juneteenth, but this is the reason why we're here as our celebration towards Juneteenth. My mother, I grew up with my mom and them were from Texas. So I knew exactly what Juneteenth was and we celebrated it as a child. But, you know, sometimes you celebrate stuff, you don't know what you celebrate, you know. And so now they just have a better, better understanding and, uh, and able to talk to, um, to that as well. It's unfortunate that we still have to try to educate our counterparts. But you're right. I mean, if, if people want to have that discussion, then I'm, I'm more than willing to have that discussion with them. Will it, will it ever make a difference totally 100%? Not until we, not until we start at the, the, the young ages when people first under, you know, understand what racism is and they grow up to be adults because it's a, it's a learned behavior. I don't, I, don't think you grow, I don't think you are born a racist. Um, I think, I think you, you've been taught that that's the way it's supposed to be. So mm -hmm. until we get rid of those people that are teaching that, then we're always going to have some form of it.